Oh. And it's recording, awesome. And then you want to share screen, and then you can just do share screen. And then when it says it, it Zoom. Will, it, will, it, will, it will. Just go to the notability app. And it's recording the notability app. Yes, it's recording the screen, so. OK, OK. Well, hopefully that works. Otherwise, I'll just have to do an extra. But we'll see. Is there anybody no, online? No. There's nobody online, huh? Yeah, there's people online. Um, people online, can you see the notability when I go to the notability? Here, I can. It's on your personal. Yeah, it's my personal. Yes. Yeah. I can't see it. Okay, apparently it is working. Oh, it works perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, let me turn this on. All right, welcome everybody. The lecture two on trusses. Um, yes, announcements. Announcements. We have lab on Friday, and the videos are up. It's the same videos as before. Uh, for the lab, I don't know if that is already enabled on Grayscope, but for the Friday session, there's not a report due this Friday, but there is a, it's a worksheet. I think it's it, in Gradescope, it should appear as a worksheet. Um, and it's basically just screenshots of you showing that you follow the video from the, from the tutorial. Uh, so not really much text, it's just basically evidence that you actually followed the video and you did the stuff in the, in the video. So you have to submit that uh, before the end of uh, the lab session on Friday. So before 1.30 on Friday. I don't know if it's enabled yet, but we will ena enable it. Uh, there is one homework due on Friday. So homework zero should have been posted yesterday on Gradescope. And like I said, that one is just bonus points. So do that. Um, it's gonna get added to the either to the lab report scores or to the to the homework scores, um, whatever benefits you the most. It's five points, I think, worth five points, and it's very basic. Just uh, name, picture of yourself, um, how how you wanna be addressed, and then why are you taking this class? Uh, yeah, just getting to know you a little bit better. I think those are the two main announcements for this week. Um, any, any questions? All right, so let's go ahead and get started with the trusses because I need to talk a lot today. So um, today, a lot of me talking and then, you know, we'll, we'll do a little bit more interactive sessions later on. Uh, first of all, a little bit of notation, math notation, for the things that we're gonna be working on for the rest of the semester. So FE is used to solve boundary value problems. That's sort of the formal definition. Boundary value problems involves not just the PDE. So you have taken the PDE class. So a boundary value problem means solving a PDE, but with some extra ingredients. Uh, first of all, as the name suggests, a boundary value problem requires a domain with a boundary. And that typically is uh, done with this notation, so some potato. Uh, typically, we use the notation omega for a potato. That's just basically some space in R2 or R3. And then the boundary, which is basically what surrounds the potato. So this is the domain, and this is the boundary. And that one, we use the notation either sort of partial omega to the node uh, boundary, or you will see, and in the book, you will see a lot of times uh, we use the letter gamma for, for that boundary. 
Um, so in 2D, the boundary is a curve. In 3D, the boundary is a surface. So that's the first ingredient. Um, then we, we need um, kinematics, which is basically what are the fields of interest that we're going to be solving for. So in the case of stress analysis, the main uh, things that we are solving for is a vector field for the displacements. So, and a vector field, like I said, a field is basically a function over a domain. So if you were to assign to every single point a vector u, then u of x is a vector field. So it's a function of the position over the domain for displacements. So this u of x is our primary unknown for the case of stress analysis. This depends on the problem that you are solving. So if you are solving a dynamic problem, so if you're interested in vibrations, then you need not just a displacement field, but you also need a vector field for the velocity. So a, a velocity field, an acceleration field. Um, and for the heat transfer, you also need a temperature field, for example, um, and so on. Like I said, the physics, all sorts of physics have some PDE and there's some associated field to them, like an electric field or electromagnetic field if you're solving electromagnetic equations and so on. Uh, but yes, for our, the purpose of this class, the main uh, field of interest is gonna be the displacement field. And this is typically called kinematics. Um, then we have another ingredient. So we have a domain with a boundary, we have whatever we are solving for. And then we have the equation that we're solving. So these typically are equilibrium equations or balance principles. So what are we solving for? In the case of uh, stress analysis, we are solving for force balance and the actual form of force balance. I don't know if you've seen this in 323, but this is basically force balance. I'll put it in quotes. In reality, it's called linear momentum balance. <clears throat> but it is the equivalent of sum of forces equals zero. It's just for in the PDE form. Um, we're gonna see what this operation does, but this is called divergence. And it has to do with some derivatives. You've probably seen this for fluids. Have you taken fluids here? So you have probably seen something like d sigma xx dx plus d sigma xy dy equals zero, something like that. And then d sigma xy dx plus d sigma yy dy equals zero. So this, if you were to expand that equation, it looks like that. It's just the this other notation with this um, triangle, it's called the nabla, but that little triangle is called nabla. So much jargon in this, uh, in this class, but that nabla dot is called the divergence, but if you were to express it in sort of the more standard partial differential equation way that you have probably seen, I'm guessing, hopefully this doesn't look super foreign, um, right? Do you not look uh, something like that in fluids? Yes, yeah. So this is very similar to the, to the fluids one. Um, so that is the equation that we want to solve. So that's this ingredient right here. So that's the, the um, equilibrium equation. Right now, it looks like the thing that we are solving for, which is the displacement field, and the equation that we need to solve, which is this linear momentum balance field, are disconnected. So one has the stress, the other has the displacement. And so we need to tie the two. And tying the two is done with this extra set of equations uh, called constitutive models or constitutive equations. And they are basically equations that will relate our fields of interest to our equilibrium equations. So we need something 
that ties the displacements to the stresses. And so for the case of um, simple linear materials as we will do in this class, you have hopefully seen something similar to this, where the stress is proportional to the strains. You may have seen it in um, more of a scalar, the scalar version. So the scalar version, when you are only looking at a single direction, then it looks like you know the stress in a given direction is the Young's modulus times the strain in that direction. But in reality, there is a matrix version of this, which is that the stress matrix, that's why I use the, typically I use the, the bar notation for vector or, or matrix quantities, is some other matrix D times this strain matrix epsilon. And epsilon depends on the, on, on the displacements. Epsilon is the gradient, actually. I put this S because it's the symmetric gradient. I know a lot of... Uh... So that finally ties basically everything together. We have a displacement field, which is what we want to solve for. We have an equilibrium equation, the force balance or linear momentum balance, this divergence of stress equals zero. And we need an equation that relates those displacements to those forces. Uh, the most, uh, the simplest one is Hooke's law. So the stresses are linearly proportional to the strains. The strains are basically just the gradient of the, of the displacements. And the last thing that we need is boundary conditions. Um, basically what forces or displacements are applied in the boundary of, of our domain. Uh, and these come in two flavors. So you either prescribe force or prescribe displacement. So you have part of the boundary, let's say this being an orange part, this part we have some, let's say we fix this part. So then if this is sort of fixed to a wall, then we know, for example, U equals some known displacement in that part of the boundary. So known displacement in this part of the boundary. And then in the rest of the boundary, we know some force, either zero or some actual force, but in the rest of the domain of the boundary. So here we know some force. So for example, if you have, and it doesn't have to be the same force all over the place. I mean, you could have something where there's some region that has some force, some region that has no force. But the point is that I know the forces in all of that red uh, part of the boundary. That's it. So that fully defines basically a problem and then it can be solved with FE not just for the stress analysis, but basically the heat transfer problem or any sort of physics-based PD that, that you want to solve. And this will, will come back to this over and over again. Any questions? All right. Now for a boundary bio problem, to solve that one, like you've done before, uh, you have solved this, like I said, analytically for very, very simple cases like a rectangle or a, or a unit circle. Uh, but in principle, you want to solve it for complicated geometries. And so one concept that will come up uh, a lot in the class is this idea of discretize the problem. So how do you describe this field uh, like U, for example, which is defined all over the the domain to something that is defined only at a few points. That's the, the point of this creation is I don't want to have some analytical expression like x squared plus y squared or 
more complicated expressions that have some logarithm or something. But actually, all I want to know to know is for some specific location. What is the value? of the field I'm interested in. So for example, let's say you have some bar that has this parabolic shape and there's some force applied to it. Then maybe the actual solution looks something like this. So let's say that as a function of x, what is the deformation of the of the bar after you solve the the linear momentum balance for for this bar? I don't know. Maybe it looks something like this. I'm making this up, but this is the real solution. And you know, this could have some ugly expression. Like I said, x squared plus logarithm of x plus exponential of x, whatever, some, some bad expression. But I don't want to do that. I don't want to recover that exact expression. All I want to know is I want to split the problem into a set of points, which we are going to call nodes in the rest of the class. And I use typically the notation X sub I to describe these special points. So in the future, I use um, the word nodes. And all I want to do is I want to know the solution at those points. So for every one of those points, what I want is, no. That's not what I want. Um, what I want is to have, what is the value of, maybe let, let me make it look something closer to the other one. What I want to know is what is the value associated with those points? And then all I need to do is some robust and consistent, consistent way of interpolating between those points. And you can think of, for instance, just linearly interpolate between the points. So I need the value at the points. And some consistent way of interpolating. And so when we do that, and we'll do that later on for the, for the mechanics and heat transfer problems, what we will recover is we will recover some solution that is not the exact solution. So we won't have access to the real solution of the problem, but it should be good enough. And then we'll give you some conditions under which you know that it is a good solution. Um, it will look like piecewise linear, but ideally it should basically get close and close to the real solution as you refine your, your mesh. So the number of points at which you evaluate. Again, questions? So main uh, takeaway, from this is we are going to be solving boundary value problems in this class uh, later on. This is not the topic for this week or even next week, but this is definitely where we are going. These are the ingredients of a boundary value problem. The two types of problems that we're going to be doing in this class are stress analysis and heat transfer. It's important to get familiar with some of this notation and some of this jargon. So that's why I bring it up from, from this point. That's one of the things. The other thing is that 
solving these problems in a very simple domain can be done analytically, but for complicated domains, you can't really solve it. So you can at best get some approximation. And that approximation involves picking certain points which we are gonna call nodes, at which we want to know the value of the solution. And then all we need is some consistent way of interpolating between those points. Those are the two main things that we're gonna be doing later on. For this week and next week, we're gonna start with a system that is already discrete. So we don't have to introduce a PDE and we don't have to worry about how do we mesh the, the system. So how do we pick these points that we want to evaluate the solution at? So we're gonna start with trusses. Trusses are, or is, they have a equivalence to that E problem that I was bringing up, bringing up, but it's already discrete. Trusses are defined by having these so-called two force members that are make up, made up of two nodes. They can either be in tension or compression. They have uniaxial loading, so they can only carry load across the, the element. There's no moments. There's free rotation at the nodes. And we are interested in the displacement at the nodes. I just want to bring up that this is an, an analogous to a boundary value problem. There is a domain with a boundary. So the domain is basically the truss uh, structure. So you can think of, use the, use the, so the domain is basically, this is our domain. Omega is this purple one. It has a boundary. The boundary are basically these two points. This is the boundary of our domain. We have some um, field of interest. This is also displacement. It's just that, that only the displacement at, at the already discretized locations. So there is a UX for this node, a UY, there's another displacement for this node, another displacement for this node. So that is what we want to solve for. We want to solve for the displacements at the different nodes. We have an equilibrium principle. In this case, for every node, so for every node, we have a displacement and also we have sum of forces equals zero for every node. And then we'll introduce a constitutive law, which is Hooke's law for the bar. So basically the stress in the bar should be equal to the Young's modulus times the strain of the bar. And the strain of the bar is directly given by the displacement of the nodes. We'll calculate it. It's just the, basically the magnitude of the displacement over the initial length of the, of the bar. And we have boundary conditions. So we have either applied uh, forces or applied um, displacements. So in this case, we know the displacements at these two nodes. Non-displacement, non-displacement. And this one, uh, color red, and this one has known force. That 10 is supposed to be a force, I think, positive X. So a lot of the things that we're gonna learn how to do with trusses basically will apply when we move to the heat transfer and stress analysis problems later on. It's just convenient that we don't need to worry about this discretization step. So we can just worry about the solution step. So we're gonna learn the solution with the trusses and then we're gonna backtrack and do the discretization for the continuous problems. All right, so for the truss element, and this is gonna, again, um, generalize when we go to the heat transfer and stress analysis uh, problems. We have, for a given element, um, denoted E, we have two nodes. So every element is made out of two nodes, and there is some corresponding force 
um, acting on node one, some corresponding force acting on node two. There's a displacement on node one, a displacement of node two. And the main thing that we know from this is we have two, two conditions basically. One is that if we want this thing to be in equilibrium, so equilibrium or element implies that F1 equals minus F2. Otherwise it wouldn't be in equilibrium. So that's one thing that we have. And the other thing that we know is the Hooke's law for the bar. that what should be the force two, for example, it doesn't matter which one, but we can think about um, what is the force at two if you displace the, uh, the second node. So you know that overall this displacement over the initial length of the bar So if you move U2 and U1, the overall displacement is U2 minus U1. So for example, if U1 is zero and U2 moves a little bit to the right, then you get some net displacement. That divided by the original length of the, of the bar gives you the strain. And that multiplied by Young's modulus and cross-sectional area. gives you the force. And the only thing that we have to be worried about here is the sign. I think this needs a minus sign. And to decide on the sign, all you need to worry about is, for example, if U2 was one, say, and U1 was zero, then the thin parentheses will be a positive value. Actually, this is correct. So the force, needed to stretch the bar would be positive. So those are the two equations that we have. We can arrange those equations in a different way. And this is gonna be convenient for, again, all of these things are generalized when we go to the, to the continuous problem. This typically we'll call KE. It's basically the same two equations that I was writing before, but just in, in arranged in a matrix format. But you can see the second equation, for example, F2, if you were to read it as an equation, would be F2 equals Ke times minus U1 plus U2, which is the exact same thing. Oh, I'm missing the over Le. I am missing over L E, which is the same as the equation that I have there. The other equation is F1 equals, again, the same factor E A over L E, U1 minus U2, which is the minus of the other equation. So again, this is nothing more than the same two conditions is what is the equilibrium for the element and what is the relationship between the forces and the kinematic uh, uh, quantities of interest, the displacements, and just arranged in a nice little format. This thing right here 
is what we call the stiffness matrix. So I use sort of the lowercase ke for this factor. This is sort of like a scalar stiffness. Um, and the matrix, so the factor times this one minus one minus one one matrix is the stiffness matrix. Make, make clear that this is a matrix, ke. So that equation right there defines basically the truss element. This is what Marcus uses. And actually the lab on Friday, you don't ever see that equation, but Abacus is evaluating that for every single truss in your, in your structure. It will evaluate that behind the scenes. It will, it will use that equation. All right. So now that we have an equation for that uh, truss element, we need to use the balance equation at the nodes to tie basically all the elements together into a big system of equations. And this is gonna be a pattern that's gonna repeat again for all the other problems that we're gonna do later on. We're gonna introduce some equation for the element that is gonna have the same type of format. It's gonna have some forces uh, or fluxes for the heat transfer problem times is a matrix. We're always gonna call it the stiffness matrix times a vector of the field of interest, either displacements or temperatures. So we want to do that, let's say, let's consider this example. There's some bar made out of two different types of cross sections. Um, this is like a 1D truss problem. We are going to discretize this problem with two elements, sort of two truss 1D elements. Notation, this is in the in the book, and I follow this notation. So this is notation for the elements. For element number. It's typically this parenthesis one, so that's element one. This parenthesis two is element two. And this is the notation for the known number. So just no parentheses, there's three nodes, one, two, three, and two elements. No, yes. Is it always true that the nodes go three, two, one, but the um, elements go one, two, three? No, you can do absolutely whatever you want uh for the for the naming conventions the only um uh, yeah you can do whatever you want we're gonna and this is a good i was actually going to say this as long as you define your mesh and we'll see how this will will play a role later on um but you can name the different like this could be element one and this could be element two and that will be fine and the nodes don't have to be one, two, three. I could say this is not one, this is not two, this is not three. That would work as well. That's, this is completely arbitrary. The, the numbering is completely arbitrary. Just need a consistent way of assembling and we'll see what this means. So what I typically do always is you need to, and 
in any cases, and this is the first thing that you're gonna do when, when you use Abacus, is you need to define your mesh. And when you open the, the input file and you see the mesh definition, how do you define the mesh? Typically, you say, you specify the nodes by their coordinates. So you have some table with the nodes, right? Here we have three nodes. And then the nodes are described in terms of, in this case, this is a problem. So they are described just in terms of their X coordinate. If this was a 2D problem, you will have X and Y coordinates or a 3D problem, X, Y, Z coordinates. So in this case, the nodes are completely specified by the X coordinate. So node one has coordinate X equals, um, I don't know what the values are, but let's say two, I don't know what the values are. Two, let's say that has value one and three has value zero assuming that the, my origin is here. So now you can see that this information is enough to uniquely define your nodes. If you were to name them differently, like you say, this is node one, this is node two, this is node three, that would be fine as long as when you define your table, you have the correct coordinate for every node. Again, for this particular example, node one is the node that has x equals two. Node two is the node that has x equals one. Node three is the node with x equals zero. And similarly, we'll have an element table. And how do you define the elements? The elements are defined by the nodes that make up the element. So element one, so which one is the first element and which one, second, first node and second node. So L1 is the element that is made out of nodes three and two. And element two is the element that is made out of nodes two and one. Here, there's just one thing that you need to respect is that you need to name the nodes from left to right. But you can see that if I had named the nodes differently or the elements differently, that table would look different, but it would have all the information that I need. So actually, you know, well, I can put my, my hand over the drawing on the left, but if you ignore basically what is on the left, and if I just give you these two tables, I just give you a notes table and an elements table, then you don't even need, you can recreate that, uh, that drawing. And actually that's why, how Abacus works. When I was, um, I don't know if people saw this on Slack, but someone was asking about the student edition, um, and I was saying, you can always export the input file, which has this type of table, and you don't need the GUI to run a, a, an Abacus job because the input file has this information and that information completely defines your geometry. So if you have the coordinates of every single node and you have the relationships of which nodes make up each element, you have all the information about the geometry. Any other question? All right, so we had said before that we introduced for every element, uh, for every truss element, we had some equation, right? So here we said, for this element, we know that the force vector for this element is gonna be the stiffness matri matrix for this element times the displacement field for this element. And for this one, we have the same equation. So it's just that the nodes are different. So from what I did a couple of slides ago, we have for any truss element, we have a relationship between the forces and the nodal displacements. That's good, but I cannot solve the problem with that. In reality, the trusses are coupled, right? Uh, and how are they coupled? They are coupled through the nodes because 
some trusses will share a node. Like you can see here, this node right here is shared by these two trusses. Uh, so how are they, they coupled? They are coupled because for every, the equilibrium equation is satisfied for every node. So you have, so there's two conditions that couple the, so two things. One is that I also need to satisfy not just the equilibrium inside of each truss, but at the nodes. Um, and the other one is that nodes are shared. Some nodes at least. Remember. I will add a page here. So the goal in the last 10 minutes is to explain the process of what I call assembly, which is out of the stress equation, So out of this equation, how do I get the coupled uh, system of equations for the entire structure? And I'll just show you the, the process and then I'll tell you what it means um, in terms of every, every nodal equation. But essentially what I want to have at the end is I want to have a big matrix, which I'm gonna call K without the E. This is my global stiffness matrix. I want that to multiply a vector u. We should have all the node displacements. And that should equal some vector f. We should have all the forces. So here, this U vector, there's only three nodes. You can already tell what the size of this, of this um, matrices and vectors should be. The displacements, there's only three nodes. So that vector with all my unknowns is just three by one. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how the assembly process works and then we'll, then we'll see what it means. But for element one, I have the K of that element. So that's basically the Young's modulus of that element, the cross-sectional area of that element, the length of that element, times one minus one minus one, one. And if you remember how I introduced this, this has node one and node two, right, of the element. And the key thing to notice here is that this is using the local node number, right? It's just one on, on two. But in reality, what I need to do is I need to delete that and just say, just change the notation to the 
my global known number. So I have the same factor. So this K1 is whatever it is for this element. But what I want to know is what is the, what are the node numbers, but not the local node numbers, but for this element, for element one, what are the nodes from my element table? So if I go back to my element table, we can see that element one is made out of nodes three and two. Those are the numbers that I need to use here. So here, this corresponds to U3 and U2. So node one of element one is actually the node that I named three in my mesh, my global mesh. And the other one is U2 and then just we repeat that here. That's all I did. I just changed the notation and I'm just using now the labels that I assigned in that mesh. So for element one, the nodes that I care about are nodes U3 and U2. So now with that information, I can go and add it up. So this one should go to the global entry U3, U3. So here I should add K1. Then this one and this one will go to the entries U2, U3. So that's right here. So minus K1, minus K1. And then the last one goes to entry U2, U2. So I'm going to end up with K1 here. I can do the same for element two. So that one has some stiffness of that element times again, one minus one minus one, one. And again, I need to go look up my table and see what are the nodes that make up element two. So if I go to my element table, I see that element two is made out of nodes two and one. And so I put here, U2, U1, U2, U1. And that tells me where should I be adding things up on that right-hand side, on that uh, global equation. So here, this entry right here should go to the U2, U2 entry. So this one will get added here. So plus K2, then this minus one goes to the U2, U1 entry and the U1, U2 entry. So minus K2 here and minus K2 here. And lastly, this one should go to the U1, U1, which is this one. There's only two elements, so I only need to do this two times. And on the right-hand side, I need to add the forces. They are just the external forces. So what are the external forces that I have on node one? So if I go to, forget about that, drawing, if we, I go back to my, to my initial problem, in node one, there's some reaction that I don't know. So it's, there's some force, I just don't know what it is, but it's the, this R1. Some reaction that I don't know. In node two, there's some external force, I should say, or oh, external forces. So either known forces, or reactions. So in nodes two and three, there's some forces that I actually know. So this F2 and F3, I actually know. So 
So now I have a full system of equations that I need to solve. What are my unknowns? We're not gonna solve it today, but my unknowns are, I'll put it with red, my unknowns are the displacement of the second node, the displacement of the third node, and the uh, reaction force. And the things that I know are, I know that displacement because that one is fixed, for example. I know that the first node is fixed because it's attached to a wall. So I know that displacement, that's part of my boundary conditions. And these are my own boundary conditions. So in green, I have my boundary conditions. Either I know the displacement or I know the force. And correspondingly for my unknowns, if I know the force, I don't know the displacement. If I know the displacement, I don't know the force. And that's it. So these are global system of equations. We'll pick this up on Monday. And yeah, for Friday, we have lab, Abacus lab. I'll upload the edited version of the slides to the bright space.